kids got stuck in with everything that we were doing and um, had a lot of fun. But their personalities really made it an enjoyable week uh, with us this morning, uh, not this morning, this last week. But uh, we're going to look at the Bible together this morning, just a few short verses at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So if you're new here, my name is Paul, I'm the lead pastor of Life Church. Not the Pope, as some of the guys on the front row uh, asked this week if, uh, if Life Church had a Pope. We certainly don't, do not have a Pope. And, um, and things. But uh, each week at Life Church, we like to open the Bible together and just see what God would have to say with us, uh, to us. We believe that the Bible is God's word to us, that it speaks to us, it reveals to us who he is and how we're to relate to him, especially in the areas of our lives and in regards to salvation and other things. And so we want to look at a few short verses at the end of one of the uh, letters in the Bible, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Now, the Apostle Paul, uh, in Acts chapter 18, it shows us that he founds the Corinthian church, and as the founding apostle of the Corinthian church, he keeps correspondence with them to kind of answer some questions that they have as they're learning to grow in their faith, but also to address a few issues. If you know anything about the Corinthian church, they were kind of a messed up bunch. I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, can relate to them. Uh, and aside from that, also Paul is using and pointing to his own life as an example of how to live out faith for Jesus. Uh, so in 1 Corinthians 11, he says to the, the Corinthian church, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And when we get to chapter 9, it's actually one of the moments where he's given us an example of what, it, what he believes it looks like to follow Jesus and how he approaches that and a kind of his mindset and his mentality for following the Lord Jesus. So we're going to read from verse 24. If you don't have a Bible, hopefully by the wonder of technology, it will be up on the screen. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. And um, I get a thumbs up or an amen. There we go from the back. Josh says it's going to be there. Brilliant. And uh, verse 24 it says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. We just pray that you would speak to us. We just pray, God, that, um, Lord, that you would help us by your spirit to not only hear the words of scripture, but also to live them out. And I just pray, God, that you give me grace and anointing and boldness to communicate your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So as you're aware, a major kind of competition has been happening in the last week. And obviously it's over now with the end of Life Kids Club, but there's also the Olympics going on, isn't there? And, um, and I love the Olympics. I love kind of any sport and event when nations are uh, coming against nations, except stuff like the Ryder Cup and uh, anything to do with cricket. Sorry, Francis. But um, I just don't get those sports. But I love the Olympics because it does expose you to kind of all different sports, nations coming together, competing with one another. Of course, for me, the real Olympics really, really starts... Although not for Britain, it's usually over by this week because we all win all the medals in kind of cycling and horseback riding and, and boating and things that you sit down. But when the, the Olympic Stadium opens and athletics takes place, for me that's like, this is where the real Olympics takes place. And of course the greatest event in the Olympics, in the athletic stadium, is the 100 metres, isn't it? And uh, how many of you know the 100 metres? Fantastic event, it's over in kind of just over nine seconds. But... When you look at the 100 meters, if there's any place where a silver medal feels more painful than any other, it's usually the 100 meters, isn't it? The difference between gold and silver is kind of like, like this, you know, when the photo finish and you think, it's so close that you kind of, if you're silver, you're just thinking, man, if only I had a pimple that day, I might have won. It's kind of like, you've got like gold, silver, bronze, never heard of him. You know, it's kind of like, this is the example of, the, the hundred meters. These guys are in it to win it, where they're forcing their heads, pushing across the line. 
And you think, if you got silver that day, you're like, should I have eaten that extra bacon for breakfast? You know, should I have done a few more uh, you know, squats or uh, leg curls before the race in the gym and, and things like that? But they're, they're all running to win a prize. I would see Paul using a sporting analogy this morning. Now, if you're familiar with the writings of the Apostle Paul, you may have picked up that he likes to use sporting terms and analogies in his writings. It seems that the Apostle Paul was a big fan of sports. He doesn't say explicitly, but we can see he definitely knew what was going on in the sporting world when you read through uh, his writings. And so he uses this analogy often for the Christian life. In fact, probably the greatest analogy he uses for the Christian life is that of a race. Now, he uses other things, like being a soldier enlisted, and um, he uses the analogy, obviously, the, of, of being the body and the bride of Christ, but he u- also uses the Christian life as a race. Of course, the race he's talking about isn't a 100-meter sprint. This is one of the long runs, isn't it? Like the marathon, essentially. This is something that takes a bit of time to get through, you cover a lot of terrain, you face a lot of obstacles, but in this passage, he's encouraged us to win, uh, to run this race in such a way that you would win the prize. And so this morning, I just want to draw out three kind of quick points from this message. And, And that one is, firstly, the race is personal. The second one is, we race for a prize. And the third one is, We race with purpose. And so, the race is personal. When Paul begins this kind of passage of Scripture in verse 24, he says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run? And you're like, well, that's that's kind of obvious, isn't it? If all you're in a race, all the runners are going to run, aren't they? And, of course, there's something in that that's saying, if you're there in the race to run, that's your race to run. You see, those guys are there not to watch the sport, but to participate in the sport. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's he's kind of hitting on a very particular game called the Ismian Games. Now, many of you are familiar with with the Olympic Games, not just in modern times, but also historically, the Olympic Games would take place in Olympia, be a huge every four years event, kind of like now, um, and predated these games by about 200 years. But this would be a biannual no, that's not right. Every two years is biannual? There we go. Um, a biannual event where they would kind of start with sacrifices to the sea god Poseidon and then kind of take part in all kind of sporting events. And those sporting events would cover running, boxing, javelin, you know, kind of throwing, uh, jumping, and even singing would be part of the Ismian Games. So I guess Wales would be in a, sh- a shot with a gold medal if... Uh, if singing was a part of that today, wouldn't it? We're, we're a singing nation. And, um, and so these are the games that Paul has in mind. And he's talking about athletes who get a lot of prestige. They're kind of really revered in their culture, especially the successful athletes. And these are guys that train for at least 10 months. And then when they sign, they sign that they're kind of fit and ready for the games, but also ready, willing to die in these games. Quite extreme at some points, especially if you participate in the boxing. And so this is a a race where you've got all these athletes showing up. They're not there to spectate. They're there to participate. And in the Christian life, it's the same with us, right? Christianity, living for Jesus, isn't a spectator sport. Now there's something in the psychology of a human being where when we watch somebody else do something, we can almost feel like we've done it ourselves. That's why if Wales is successful in rugby, what I tell English people is say, we beat you, we won the Six Nations. I didn't do anything. Like, I barely watched the thing, but the bit that I did watch and the bit that I cheered on, I still feel like as a Welshman, I played a part in that. And so we tell kind of the English or the Scots or the Irish, we we beat you, we won, didn't we? Because there's something about watching something that you feel like you've participated in it. That's why you find a lot of kids on YouTube these days watching other people play video games when they could be playing video games themselves. Probably both not very healthy, but uh, such is life, isn't it? And, um, and so, with Christianity, it's our race to run. It means nobody else can have your prayer life for you. Nobody else, by virtue of their faith in Jesus, 
or, or what they do for the Lord Jesus can be saved for you. Having a, a, a Christian parent isn't going to mean that you are now a follower of Jesus. Having somebody in your life, whether it's a pastor or, or, a, or a spouse or, or a parent or, or a child or somebody that, that is praying for you, doesn't negate the fact that you are called to have a prayer life. Having somebody in your life that knows and studies the scriptures doesn't negate your responsibility to study the scriptures. Having other people in church that seem to, to evangelize and tell people about Jesus doesn't negate your responsibility to tell people about Jesus. This race is a personal one for you to run. And so we, we, we see that kind of... Yeah, and of course in... In the passage here, I realize I've got my notes all backwards. There we go. Um, because one of the things that we, we know about running a race, it can be quite difficult, isn't it? And so one of the good things about the Christian life, why, whether it, while it's our race to run, we do have people around us that cheer us on and encourage us as we go, isn't it? I remember when I did, um, you know, the, the 10K race, uh, couple of years back for the Movember run. It was uh, the first time I'd ever run 10K, very difficult for me, but you know what? It was really good to kind of have runners at different points come alongside and you strike up conversation, you encourage one another, you cheer one another on and, and that kind of thing. And so that was a real encouragement. Now they couldn't cross the finish line for me. They couldn't run for me, but they could, they could encourage me and spur one another on. And so that's the part that we do play. We have people that kind of have gone ahead of us and, and know the Lord Jesus and can share what they've learned with us. You know, in the sense of when I was uh, doing a bit more running than I am today, I, you know, I watched some YouTube videos on, on different kind of running tips and running gear and different stuff, and all that's very helpful, but the reality is none of that meant that I had run. I still had to get up out of my bed in the morning, put on my trainers, and do the running myself. I still had to show up on on race day for the 10K or the half marathon I did last year and, and do that. And it's the same with our Christian life. It's our race to run. The second point is we race for a prize. You know, it's interesting about this passage that Paul talks to us. He says, all the runners uh, uh, run, but only one receives a prize so that it may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control uh, in order they do this to receive a perishable wreath, so that's their prize there, the perishable wreath. And then he goes on to say at the end, it is that lest after preaching to others, I should not be disqualified from the prize. And so there, he's talking about this thing called the prize. There's, a, there's something in front of them that, that is a prize. Now, in the Isman games, they had kind of like a pine wreath that they would wear. And literally something that would perish after a few days. Before that, they actually had celery reefs, if you can believe that. It's sticking a salad on your head after you've won the Isthmian Games. But in, in this case, you think that's, that's something that's going to go old in like a couple of days, especially in the heat of Greece, and you're going to throw it out. It's going to be no good. And even in um, our sporting events today, we still have some very odd prizes. You know, guys who cycle for 2,000 miles across France, or for a yellow T-shirt, you know, and you think, wow, that's, that's, that's kind of, is, is not as exciting as the kind of the gold World Cup trophy, is it? Or the, the ashes, you know, five days of intense cricket, and it's like a little terracotta urn with, with burnt cricket stumps inside. You know, it's hardly the, the kind of the glitz and glamour of the Formula One trophies that you see after every Grand Prix, is it? And so we have some interesting prizes today. But all these prizes, they're perishable. They're not going to last. And so the, the Paul makes the point that this is an eternal prize that we receive. And this eternal prize, is, 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 what, what's he talking about? Is he talking about salvation? Well, he can't be talking about salvation because he's talking about a prize that we obtain. And as you know, salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's all about what Jesus Christ has won for us. So what's the prize he's talking about? And I believe there's, there's kind of a couple of clues, both in the passage and also in Scripture as well. I think, firstly, 
this prize in this context, Paul has talked previously in this passage about how he, he kind of presents himself in different ways to win and connect with different people for the gospel. And so one of the first prizes he's talked about is actually winning souls for the kingdom, is leading people to Jesus Christ. It's kind of his focus, his aim, his, his desire, his mission, even to the point when he's writing to the Romans, he says, I wish that I was accursed that my fellow countrymen, the Israelites, would come to know Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Because all this stuff that, that we have, our cars, our houses, our clothes, our money, we can't take that with us into eternity, can we? It's all going to burn up. In, in fact, if you've ever visited a rubbish dump and you kind of see there everything that's, that's kind of on the pile or sometimes stacked along the side, and you see TVs that once were something that somebody had worked hard for, saved up for, or stuck on their wall or their or their kind of TV cabinet was like, oh, I've got this wonderful brand new TV. Now it's just a pile of junk in a garbage dump. Can't take those things with us, can we? You know, our cars have failed. How, how many of you remember that one special car that you bought? You're like, oh, this is an amazing car. I've just worked really hard for this. I've saved this. Or, uh, you know, it's kind of got the, all the, 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 the latest stuff on there and you, you, that, that maybe other cars didn't have up until that point. Like, wow, this is an amazing car. And then after a few years, it's like, car's gone. Gets in an accident. Wear and tear. Kids leave stains all over the back seat and crumbs all over the floor and, uh, and different things. And so it, 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 these things perish. But you know what? How we impact people for Jesus is eternal. Sharing the message of Jesus with somebody and seeing that person realize who Jesus Christ is, that he loves them, that he's died for them, that he's risen again, that if they put their trust in him, they can spend eternity with him, that their sins can be forgiven. And that they receive that message and spend eternity with us and with Christ in heaven. That, that is a wonderful truth. That is something that we can take with us. But then also, in Philippians 3, uh, verse 12 and onwards, Paul writes this, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what it lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So his goal there, that he hasn't obtained it, he hasn't been perfected, but he presses on to it. It is to kind of know Christ and be made mature in Christ. And so this is the other element of our prize. Is in this life, we get the wonder and the, and the beauty of, of growing in maturity and Christ-likeness in Jesus and that maturity being displayed to people around us, but also knowing Christ through the trials and tribulations and the highs and lows that we won't know in terms of, you know, because the, the, the struggles that we have now allow us to know and see and experience a different side of God's character that maybe we won't see when we're in perfect heavenly bodies where everything is kind of tickety-boo in eternity. And so we kind of have this opportunity now to know him, to grow mature in him. And that's also our prize, Jesus Christ himself, to know him in that way. And so Paul hits on that in, in Philippians 3, and it's really interesting when he says, I press on towards the goal. And um, he uses this a word in the Greek called the scopus, which is actually a, a, a term that's connected to running. He's using a sporting analogy here to where when they run in a race, they have something that they're focused on called the scopus, and they're running towards it to kind of keep them running in the direction that they should be running. So um, we see that this is a prize that's eternal. But also... What's good about this prize is everybody can win the prize. You know, when Paul's writing about these runners who are running in a, such a way, but only one obtains the prize, that's not true of the heavenly prize, is it? And this isn't kind of like primary school where you're like, yeah, you know, everybody gets a certificate, everybody's done well, even though little Johnny spent the whole time picking his nose and didn't do anything. You know, it's like, it's like this, is, this isn't like that. You still, you've still got to run in a way to obtain it, but it's not a zero-sum game. It isn't like... If I win, that means Jared loses. Or if Jared wins, that means that um, Juana loses. It, it's, it's not, it doesn't work like that. In fact, it works the opposite in a sense of if 
if we're kind of pursuing Jesus, the, the, the calling that he has for us, relationship with him, if I'm doing well, that can actually help you do well. And if you're doing well, that can help me do well because I'm going to be inspired by your fire and your passion for Jesus. I'm going to be inspired by your witness. I'm going to be inspired by your maturity in Christ, your knowledge of Christ, your love for him. And so it's one of these prizes all of us can win. And some of us, sometimes we, we, we feel like we, we, we're spectating at Christianity, we're looking at other people around us doing well, and, and, and we end up comparing ourselves to others. You know, Paul, in writing to this same group of people in his second letter in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, says you shouldn't compare yourselves amongst yourselves or commend yourselves by yourself. By doing this, it's not wise. How many of us find ourselves sometimes, we look at our lives and we reflect our lives based on how well we think somebody else is doing. And of course, we know a whole lot about ourselves and a whole little about somebody else. And in that scenario, they always seem to win out, right? And the reality is we don't know what their race looks like. We don't know the obstacles that they are going through, that they've come through. We don't know the challenges. But what we do know is if they've kept running, we can keep running too. If they've kept on their knees praying, we can get on our knees and pray too. If they've kept in the Word and quoted Scripture and, and um, learning Scripture and, and using Scripture to kind of strengthen and encourage themselves, we can do that too. We know if, if even in the midst of challenges, sometimes we're like, oh man, the, 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 the world just feels so on top of me. I don't feel like I can share Jesus with anyone because I don't know where he is. Sometimes that's a great time to share Jesus because it means actually... Number one, you're not focusing on what you're going through. But number two, it's the reality of your life. It says, actually, it's not that I'm perfect. It's not everything's good. It's not that this race is easy. But it's the fact that Jesus is with me in it. And I keep running for him. It's actually a testimony in and of itself. And so this is a race that everyone can win. And then finally, Paul says here that we can be disqualified from the prize when he's talking about we, 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 race, we race to win a prize. He says we can be disqualified. What does that mean? Does that mean he's talking about losing salvation? No. But it means that we can run in such a way that our impact for Jesus makes no impact at all. In fact, it, it, we, we can harm our impact for Jesus if we kind of get caught up in sin or... Uh, we treat people in, in a way that Jesus wouldn't treat people, if we're holding on to unforgiveness or bitterness, or if we are lacking in our prayer life, and our prayer life and our time in the Word is being robbed by other things, it, it can disqualify some because it's really hard to minister out of emptiness, right? In the same way, I don't know if anybody, have you ever tried to do a workout or a run where you haven't eaten anything for a long time and you have no energy or fuel in the tank? Yeah? It, 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 it's It's difficult. It's, um, it's very hard to do. In fact, you're probably not going to be able to sustain anything. And you're probably going to have to kind of stop short. Or in, a, in some cases where people have eaten too much or junk food right before a race and their bellies are full, they've got to stop too, isn't it? And um, so in the same way, if we don't want to be disqualified, it's about what are we putting in to sustain us in this race? What are we saying no to that's going to harm us in this race. Remember last week how we, we talked about being yes people. Saying yes to Jesus means also saying no to other things. Now, the Bible says, now, not everything is harmful, but not everything is beneficial, right? Or I think that it's, it's um, some things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. So something might be not wrong in and of itself, might not be sin, but it might hinder you in your walk with the Lord really pressing in to prayer, to the word, to, 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 to witnessing, to saying no to sin and other things. And, and these are the things going to harm us when, when the challenges come, when the trials come, when the race gets a bit more tricky, when it feels like we're going uphill in life. These are the things that are going to hinder us. And so for us, it's kind of gearing our lives to say, say no to those things, to say yes to them so that we won't be disqualified, which kind of leads me to uh, the, the last point and touches on that. We race with purpose. And, and when Paul is talking about that, he's talking about those guys in the event are running to win the prize. Now, 
it's something you probably don't know about the Isthmian Games and even the, the early Olympics, is that if you lost, it was actually not just embarrassing. It wasn't like, a, you know, uh, oh man, I, I, I tripped at the final hurdle or I, I just couldn't quite make it or I ran out of steam, you know, on the marathon where the guy had that amazing burst of energy for the last 100 meters and I just didn't have it in the tank. It's like, like they would beat you, <laughs> if you like, and embarrass you, publicly humiliate you if you didn't win. And so these are kind of intense things in the running. And in the boxing, they didn't have kind of three rounds and points and everything else. They boxed till somebody was knocked out. And so you, you go in these things and you want to be prepared. You want to have a mindset. I want to win this thing. Like I, I'm like here not to be uh, embarrassed by that. And so there's a lot of training and preparation that goes in. Paul, Paul talks about these guys are in strict training, and he even uses an analogy himself, it, it, is that he puts his body, makes his body a slave. It's like I punch my body, I beat my body, make it my slave to be able to do what God has called him to do in the same way that these runners do. And he says, I don't punch the air, and I don't run aimlessly. You know, when we go back to that, that word scopus, He's got his eyes fixed on something. He wants to land his punches. In the same way, athletes, what, what do they do in preparation for the Olympics? They, they make sure their sleep is right, their diet is right, they make sure that, the, that their, their lifestyles are revolved around trying to achieve gold at the Olympics. You know, we, we look at, um, was it Team Sky for uh, the Tour de France? And obviously they were the backbone of our our kind of cycling team of the Olympics for the last kind of X amount of years. And I remember just kind of reading about them in a book, how they do these things called the, like in, incremental um, increases. And so they were looking at every aspect of these racers' lives. And so what they found is like, when we book certain hotel rooms, the temperatures in the hotel rooms have got to be between certain degrees so that they will sleep well. They have particular mattresses that suit the different riders. And so they don't use the hotel mattresses. You know, I, I like Premier it's a pretty good mattress. But they're like, they're bringing in on tracks the particular mattresses that these guys need to sleep on. The same pillows, the same quilts, everything. So that these guys are getting the best sleep. They're looking at their nutrition. They're looking at their, the way that they're exercising. Different things that can bring improvements. They're looking at the bikes and different materials on the bikes and everything else to make sure that these guys can win, you know, the Tour de France and then gold at the Olympics as they did in, I think, in 2012 and after that as well. And, and so this is kind of the preparation and the mindset that goes into this. And it's amazing, because as I've been reading this passage, I'm thinking, oh, I, I don't think I look at Christianity like this, because a lot of Christianity is, is in this kind of long day-to-day. -day. A lot of it's just like, I'm just living day-to-day -day for Jesus. And I'm just trying to work out. And, and, and if I'm being honest with you, and probably many of you are the same, there's many days where we think, I don't have my eyes on any prize whatsoever. You know, I'm just having my eyes on, oh man, I've got to get car insurance again, or um, we've got to paint the part of our house now that's, uh, that, you know, or, or kind of find contractors to do our roof and other things like that. Just the, the day to day life. And of course, for us, whilst we're not looking to achieve this, this high moment like the Olympics, actually winning the prize for us does look like walking with Jesus day to day is making sure actually even though there's there's the, the the mundane part of life and Paul even writes to the Thessalonians doesn't he just kind of live a quiet life work with your hands and so Paul acknowledges that that life isn't like a, a rocky movie do you know what I mean where you, you just kind of you've got this big goal and you achieve it and the big obstacle of Mr. T in the way or anything like that it's, it's kind of actually a, a lot of life is just day to day but to get through the day to day, and especially when the storms come, and to make sure that we win, and, and we win by knowing Jesus more, looking like Jesus when these storms come, continuing to, to impact other people's lives for Jesus, so our focus isn't purely on us, but it's outwards as well, it, it, it's just in the day to day, saying, I'm going to pray today. Whether it's five minutes, whether it's now, I'm going to get up, I'm going to make sure that there's prayer in my life. I'm going to get in the scriptures today, whether it's a verse or a whole book of the Bible, but I'm going to get the Word of God in me. I'm going to 
uh, just in my, in my prayer, say, Lord, keep my eyes open today. When I'm looking around, there'll be opportunities to witness to people. When, when sin and temptation comes our way, we're, we're going to keep short accounts with God that if we mess up, we say, God, forgive me. I want to repent of that. But hopefully, we, we can, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, see the way of escape and realize there's no temptation that's overcome us that is not common to man. But God is faithful that we would flee from it. And our minds are, because they're saturated with God, we we're keeping him in our day-to-day -day through prayer, through Bible reading, that we can say, actually, no, I want to say no to that because that's going to hinder me from being able to run the race well. And, and so it's kind of having that, that mindset that we race with purpose. And so that, that, that means, in many ways, that, that we allow our minds to be filled with the things of God so that our mind says to our body what it should be doing and not our body saying to our minds what it should be doing. You know what I mean? How, how many of us know that, that, that we can often be led by our bodies when our body is just, you know, tells us it's hungry, you know, our body determines when we eat, what we eat, how much we eat, you know, whether or not we say no to um, that, that cheesecake, which is very difficult to do and, uh, and everything else. And... Um, when we get out of bed, it often kind of leads the way. But athletes don't think like that, do they? Athletes tell their body what to do. They say no to things. They get up when they don't want to, to go train. And then they, you know, Marlene and Jill are inspiration to me because I think five o'clock each morning they're at the gym and, and things like that. And I was talking to Ollie the other week and I was like, oh, if they can do it, I need to do it as well. So, so, um, <clears throat> so this week I have, uh, inspired by both Marlene and Jill and this message, been getting up early to exercise, but um, hopefully you see the difference. But um, <laughs> just joking. But um, <clears throat> but yeah, there, there there is that thing. But this is you know, Paul says bodily exercise profits a little, doesn't he? But godliness is of great gain. And so for us as Christians, it's, it's actually having a shift in thinking that we don't need to be ruled by this flesh. In fact, the Spirit of God gives us the power to say no and overcome the flesh. And it's not that we treat our flesh as an enemy. We're not like monks from you know, the, 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 the medieval times that would beat their bodies and think it's an evil thing and, and that kind of thing. No, we need to look after the housing that God has given us to be able to live this life well. But it shouldn't be the thing that determines what we do and how we do it. It should be a transformed mind renewed by the word of God that determines how we live, what we do, you know? Because if we're being honest, in, in, in our flesh, sometimes when, when stuff goes wrong, we want to be frustrated and angry about it, you know, and, 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 and take it out on someone. That can happen. It, but that's not the way that God would want us to live. That's not a good way to run the race. You know, when people hurt us, we want to hold on to unforgiveness, right? It's kind of our, what our body wants, what our flesh wants, and it's kind of, but the Bible shows us a different way, that even as God in Christ forgave us, so we must also forgive others. Different way, different mentality, different way of thinking. And, and these are, these are many ways, it's not rocket science, is it? These are very simple things. It's not like we're Eric Liddell from the chariots of fire. You know, just ordinary people live in day-to-day -day lives. But Eric Liddell is an inspiration to us in this way, and a guy that said no to fame, he achieved success in the Olympics, but then he gives his life to the mission field in China, where ultimately he dies in a, a Japanese prisoner of war camp, giving his life for the gospel. And even in prison, there he's sharing Jesus with others. And there's a guy that, that, that said no to the things of this world for the sake of Jesus. Now, not all of us, our lives will look that dramatic like moving to China. But hey, if God's calling you to China, that's amazing. But for, for many of us, it's just going to be about, am I going to go across the road and invite my neighbor to church? Am I going to speak to my work colleague about Jesus? Am I going to love my really difficult family member, even though it's tough, but I know that they, know they need to know Jesus and I want to be a good witness to them. Sometimes it's just those things. And to be able to do those things well 
We need to say no to some things that are going to hinder us and say yes to the things that will fuel us. Prayer, word of God, living righteously, saying no to sin. Not rocket science, but sometimes we miss these things because our eyes have been taken off the prize, which is living for Jesus, making an impact for him, knowing him, being mature in him, and we've missed sight of that. And so this morning, this is an encouragement to all of us after the back of a week of conversations to say, Jesus is the most precious thing, the most wonderful thing that we could have in our lives, that we could, people could see in our lives, that we could share with other people. And we want to make that count. And so this morning, if you're here this morning and you're, you're thinking, Paul, man, I... I, uh, I I follow Jesus, I love Jesus, but boy, I've taken my eyes off the prize. I, I, I've kind of focused on other things rather than him making an impact to him. This morning is, 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 is your morning to actually, in, in the next few moments, we're just going to bow our heads together, just actually say a prayer to him, say, Lord, I want you to be my focus again. I, I want, want to live a life that is impactful for you, even if it's in the small things in the day to day. And if you're here this morning and you're thinking, man, I have zero focus or aim to my life, I've never known Jesus Christ, and, and I want actually, I want to know forgiveness of sins. I want to know relationship with Jesus Christ. That as I've been speaking, as we've been singing these songs this morning about the cross of Christ and, and what he's done, how he's given his life for us, that we may know him, that we may be set free from sin. If that's you this morning, you have the opportunity this morning to come to Christ, to know him, to live a life that counts. <laughs> One of the kids from Tubbs is just waving. Um, uh, and, and, and be impactful for, for him. So I'm just going to pray. And if you're here this morning, we just bow your heads, close your eyes, and I'm going to pray in a few minutes. But if you're this, here this morning, and, and we're not going to ask anybody to come up or anything scary, but I just want to, as a sign to the Lord, if you're here this morning, say, Paul, I, I just need to, to, to just kind of come back to focusing on Jesus, where I've been running aimlessly, but running with an aim again. And I want to do that this morning. And I want to, I want to pray for you. Um, can you just raise your hand? You just slip it up. And um, there's a few hands. I'm going to pray for you this morning. Thank you. And uh, if there's anybody here, you're here this morning, you say, Paul, I, I don't know what I, I, I'm feeling or experiencing in this place, but something in my heart tells me Jesus Christ is real and I want to know him. If that's you this morning, just raise up your hand. We want to pray for you. If you want to know Jesus Christ, you don't know Jesus Christ. This morning. And there's always opportunity afterwards when we fellowship together. We have tea and coffee out the back in a few moments. We'd love for you just to come and chat to us. I'm available to talk. Jared's available as well. Uh, and a few others. We'd love to chat to you about the Lord Jesus. But I'm just going to pray. And... Um, and then we're going to move into a time of fellowship, which I was going to close us out and move into a time of fellowship. But Lord, Lord, we thank you, God, that, uh, that Jesus Christ is a prize worth running for, worth following, knowing him, being impactful for him. Lord, our heart's desires this morning, even as uh, some of us have raised our hands, even, even myself this week, as I've, I've seen this, uh, this scripture and just been challenged by you, Lord, we want our eyes and our hearts to burn for you, to be fixed on you, Lord, for you to be our everything, Lord Jesus, and for our lives to revolve around this one thing, knowing Jesus and making Jesus known to others, whatever that looks like, whatever that costs, Lord. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that for those that raise their hand, Lord, that you would do a supernatural work of grace in their lives to be able to run in that way, Lord. For those who are struggling and feeling the challenge of running for you, Lord, that you would give them grace and strength in the midst of it. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, for those that don't know you this morning, God, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that they would have a heart and desire to know you, that they would know that Jesus Christ is the most wonderful person that they could ever know, that they can be forgiven of their sins and spend eternity with him. Lord, so I thank you for this church, Lord. I pray a blessing upon this church. Lord, and I also pray, God, for our nation, Lord, at the moment, Lord, as this, these various things are going on up and down the country, Lord. We thank you, God, that your word says you are a prince of peace, Lord, and we just pray that there would be peace in this nation, and we pray, God, 
Lord, what the enemy may try to use for evil in our land, that you would use for good. Lord, that even in, in the midst of uh, the violence and the protests and anything else that's going on and, and, the, and the, the, the pressure and the, the people are feeling and the, the, the grief of families that have lost people, Lord, we pray, God, that you would turn these things for good, that ultimately that the, the people would come to know you through it, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that there would be peace in our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'll close.